Thank you for having me here. I, it's the first time I'm speaking publicly in, uh, in Islamabad in this way, in a, in a community hall. It's a, it's a pleasure to do so. Most of our speeches across Pakistan have been in the university campuses with the students. We toured around uh, 26 universities, including those in Quetta and Peshawar, and we had a fantastic response in doing some of the work which I'm about to speak to you about. But it's also fantastic to be able to extend this work um, into the community. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because, of course, as some of you may be thinking, how does speaking about extremism at Qutqas in Islamabad address some of the problems that the country is facing? So I'm assuring you that we are actually touring the country. Um, and we've been to Swat, and we've been to, quite as I said, we've been to Interior Sin, uh, and, and Imran and some of the Khudi uh, team in the, in the uh, audience here today are regularly engaged in this work, even in my absence. Now, I wanted to address uh, the global rise of extremism and with a particular focus on the youth. And I will begin by drawing uh, lessons from my own life story because some of you may be familiar with my life story and some of you may not be. So uh, I will start with my own experiences. And just to say to you that uh, the vulnerability of youth is particularly highlighted in my own journey. And that's why we're trying to use my experiences through uh, Khudi as a vehicle to warn young Pakistanis from some of the trappings of joining such extremist organizations. I was born and raised in the UK and at 16 years old joined an extremist organization that is not a terrorist organization. Uh, they do not believe in targeting hotels and marketplaces to blow uh, civilians up. But they do believe in an extremist ideology, being that when they get to power, they will enforce a particular dress code over society, they will declare a, a war against neighboring countries, uh, they, they believe in, uh, in, in death for the apostate, and many such ideas that we're used to hearing uh, across uh, Pakistan from certain quarters. You've probably noticed the way in which the atmosphere in Pakistan has changed over the years to gradually becoming more and more suffocating, more and more difficult to dissent. And the democratic activists are finding it harder to speak about their message without fear of violence or repercussions against them. Why is that? Why are the democratic activists on the back foot? And why is this Islamist narrative seemingly dominating uh, on the streets, even if not everyone is joining those organizations? And I think to answer these questions, what we need to first of all consider are some of the failures. Some of the failures that have, um, that have plagued other efforts to bring about change. And I'll focus uh, regionally as well as inside Pakistan. The 50s and 60s was an era of growing Arab nationalism, where Gamal Abdel Nasser was seen as a great hero, and Arab socialism was, was the ideology to be advocating. And here in Pakistan, uh, you know, we know the successes of uh, Zulfiqar Bhutto and how popular he was. The 50s and 60s was this era that you didn't see extremist Muslim organizations dominating the scene. But what happened that changed that scene from the 50s and 60s to the point where we got to the, the 80s and the 90s and we saw the complete annihilation of socialist organizations and movements and their takeover by Islamist organizations, by people like me who saw so socialists as the enemy. And quite frankly, we were very keen, we were very keen to wipe out any influence that such groups had on the mindset of young Muslims. So in the medieval era, identity was defined by, uh, primarily by religion. But we moved on to, we moved on from that. Humankind, the world, moved on from that to the point where we enter the age of the nation state. And in the age of the nation state, identity was primarily defined by ethnicity, by ethnic identity. And so Europe witnessed the rise of the nation state, and we saw Germany for the Germans. We saw uh, the Scandinavian countries all broke up and the Norwegians had their own country, and the Danes and the Dutch had their own country, and the English had their own empire. And the age of the nation state defined identity by racial de definitions, and from there, empires expanded along racial lines. So the British Empire expanded. Fascism emerged, which was an extension of nationalism. An ugly extension of it, but albeit an extension of nationalism. And then society moved one step further, into the liberal age, where identity became defined by citizenship and allegiance, and not by religion, necessarily, and not by ethnicity. 
So if you take the example of America, you could be American Italian, you could be American Jewish, you could be American Muslim, American Pakistani, and everyone was American. To the point where if you look at America today, they've almost reversed what I grew up with, believing would never happen. The most famous rapper is a white man, and the president of America is a black man. They've reversed what I, in my teenage years, would have, would have waged a bet that could never have happened. But that's the result of the citizenship identity, uh, equaling, equalizing out the inequalities within society. And that's the liberal age. But then society moved one step beyond that, again, on a global level, comparing it to the rest of the world. The rest of the world was moving towards citizenship and then transnational allegiances, Muslim-majority countries, stuck with ethnicity as an identity at best and regressed towards religion at worst. And then something happened. Globalization struck. And because we missed the middle stage of citizenship, globalization we couldn't miss because by its very nature it's all permeating. So what was the effect of globalization onto the mindsets of societies that have not yet moved into the citizenship phase? The effect was that we also, as Muslims, began thinking of globalized networks. But the globalized blocks that we began thinking of weren't rested upon the citizenship notion, but rested upon the identity that we had, which was ethnicity or religion. So we've been working in Pakistan now for three or uh, two and a half years, seeding Khudi, this social movement that will challenge extremism and promote the democratic culture here. But at the same time, we've been working in countries such as Libya. We have an existing network there now, ready. And the next stage is to create a similar movement in Libya and link it up with this movement here in Pakistan. <coughs> Now you may call me ambitious, but after that we're seeking to, 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 to look at countries like Somalia and Yemen and create similar youth movements there and link them all up, just as Bin Laden did, but for the democratic culture, so that we create a new revival and commitment to democratic values across Muslim-majority societies. Already within Pakistan, Khudi has at, under its umbrella individuals who have created their own movements and have decided to come on board so that we can all work together, again, just like Bin Laden did with Ayman al and merge our resources. So in the audience we have Ali Abbas Zaidi, who's the founder of the Pakistan Youth Alliance, but has also agreed to work with Khudi and merge our efforts so that they provide the flood relief, we provide the ideational direction and the democratic uh, discussions and the training for the young people in the universities. Now this sounds like a grand vision, but trust me, when I first joined his with Dahlia at 16, and we spoke about the global Khilafat, trust me what I say to you, I've been chased from mosques and beaten by Muslims who have said to me, how dare you bring politics into the mosque and abuse our religion. That was almost 16 years ago. My look how times have changed. Now if I talk about the Khilafat, no one's going to beat me. In fact, I was attacked in Lahore for the opposite reason, for speaking exactly like this. And that's how times have changed. When we joined these movements at the young age of 16, people said we were dreaming, that you would never convince Muslim-majority countries to adopt the Khilafat. And here we find ourselves in Pakistan where only two months ago, a brigadier and four other officers were arrested for planning a coup to bring about exactly that. So I've seen within my own lifetime how the narrative can change. And the purpose of this talk here was to share that vision so that we can create buy-in for this vision across the world and to invite all of you not only to lend support morally to our cause, but actively and physically. If you have youth, send them to join Khudi. If you have networks, open your doors to Khudi. It's early days yet. We don't have the capacity to do many things. We're slowly working to build the chapters across the country. But again, it's my assurance to you that in 10 years' time, in 20 years' time, and not tomorrow and not next week, but you will begin seeing a change in the narrative, just as I've seen the change coming back to Pakistan 11 years later. And I've seen how different this country is because of the, the fact that the extremist message has gone unchecked. And with that, I, I, I end, I conclude. Feel free to ask any questions and, and any, uh, make any comments, and in fact, even challenge me on anything that you didn't like, uh, even if it's um, you know, off topic, I'm, I'm, I'm more than willing to address anything. And thank you so much for your patience. How could that radical, de radicalization happen to you? Was it something going on in Egyptian prisons that they are trying? They were trying to, you know, convert those who were, who were convertible to the right path, or it was just some other thing happening in your life? I was fortunate to come just after the de-radicalization efforts of Egypt's largest terrorist organization, Gamal Islamiyah. 
And he began writing, in Arabic, books refuting the previous jihadist ideology from a theological background, using Islam to refute extremism. And I read all of those books cover to cover. In fact, I've still got them with my writing in them from prison, with all my notes in them, and they had a profound impact on me. Because these were individuals who I grew up lionizing. I grew up, you know, hero worshipping these guys as the pioneers of my ideology. Like a communist would love, you know, Marx or someone. These were the founding fathers of my ideology. And here I was in prison with them, and they were writing books saying they were wrong. It had a profound impact on my mentality. So I had the fortune of studying those books in Arabic and studying them deeply to a point where I began changing my views. Uh, and also Amnesty's uh, efforts, they adopted us as, as prisoners of conscience. Uh, I just want to know two things, and, or rather I want to clear two confusions. Uh, the one is that what's your mission uh, which you are going to use, your mission statement which you are going to use uh, for the youth of Pakistan, especially in those areas like Kuwait Times, speaking about Balochistan, uh, specifically for those youth who are not that much, uh, they, uh, they are not having that much exposure. And number two is that uh, how you are going to cope up with the, that type of uh, resistance which you will face uh, in such kind of areas. Okay. And students are there, but they are, they are not really that much. I think one of the things that we analyzed was that um, the, the Pakistan wide narrative, okay, let's start from this. Groups advocating democratic ideals were hitherto restricted to provincial organizations. You know, the, the, the regional organizations that were fighting on behalf of rights for the ethnic groups. They were very de democratic. But on a Pakistan-wide basis, the groups that were fighting and arguing for the integrity of Pakistan tended to be the Islamists, because the army was you know, supporting that as a tactic to keep Pakistan as one. What we decided was needed was actually a group that's Pakistan-wide, but with democratic values. So it's the best of both worlds. Thank you for coming. Where are you from? I'm from Somalia. Two yeah. questions. Uh, the first one is I have read in Wikileaks that the FBI has manuals that claim that all Muslims are extreme, even those who are not following themselves are. Yeah. Yeah. I've they seen have, that. They, yeah. they have uh, extremist tendencies. So what are we going to do about that? Isn't that putting a, 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 flame, a, a gas in a flame that's already burning? Yeah. Yeah. The other question is uh, in Somalia, Two million people are in crisis right now, caused by uh, drugs. Uh, and the Al Shabaab group, extremist group Al Shabaab, uh, have banned the food aid, claiming that WFP food is a uh, Christian food <laughs> and it's not allowed in Somalia. <laughs> so, what do you do if you were in Somalia or if, you, if this has happened in Pakistan? Yeah. That's my two questions. Thank you so much. Uh, for the sake of the audience, what you referred to was an FBI training manual um, that was, uh, they were being taught, counter-terrorism oper operatives within the FBI were being taught, um, as according to this report, I mean, you know, I haven't spoken to the people directly, but according to this news report, they were being taught that Islam is inherently extreme. And what do we do about that? So, of course, as well as having Hudi here in countries like Pakistan, in, in London, I uh, basically run... Uh, the world's first counter-extremism think tank that works directly with governments in the West because my analysis or our analysis was that the problem in the West was one of policy and the problem in Muslim-majority countries was one of the lack of a social movement advocating democratic change. So what we've tried to do is plug both of those problems. So in the West we run a think tank that works with governments to change policy mistakes. One of the mistakes is this. So we, we provide training to, um, to American government as well, but actually across Europe and even in the UK um, we provide training to these sorts of people to actually differentiate for them Islam from extremism so that they don't just blame all Muslims. We have successfully uh, influenced UK and US and EU government policy on a lot of these matters. So we're working very hard to address this concern that you've raised. Thank you so much all of you for your time and thank you for being so patient.